this week on the Back Table Podcast. You know, excellent vessel prep makes a big difference. And if you're a center that can't afford drug-coated balloons and you're, you're sparing on your stent use, regardless of anything, I think we have to revisit how we do balloon angioplasties. And I think in all the thought leaders and key opinion leaders, whatever you want to call them, you know, that I've been around, everyone comes away from these trials and says, you know what, we did a real bad job of uh, balloon <laughs> angioplasty. <laughs> and, and now we know it. You know, so so the big dogs up there, you know, and there are many smart, smart, smart people uh, that I try to stick around. Uh, they all seem to believe strongly in that, even when there's disagreement everywhere else. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Back Table Podcast. If you are a new listener, welcome. For all of our regular listeners, welcome back and thank you for listening. You can find all previous episodes of the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or our website, backtable.com. Really easy to remember. Subscribe to the podcast, leave us a review, or reach out to us on social media. We have a lot of different ways to get in touch with us, so let us know how we can make this podcast a better resource for you guys, and we're going to do our best to make that happen. Quick announcement, I'll get out of the way. You can get free CME for listening to Backtable. Check out the show notes. It's there. Grab it. Free for our audience, which is you. Now a quick word from our sponsor. Minimize vessel trauma, dissections, and the need for bailout stenting above or below the knee with a chocolate PTA balloon. The balloon's unique night null constraining structure creates pillows and grooves that provide a predictable, uniform, and atraumatic dilatation. Learn more about the product details and safety information at medtronic.com backslash peripheral. BD understands that anything that can help to save time, space, and reduce complexity in the lab is essential. The Rotorex atherectomy system is simple to set up and easy to use with a small plug-and-play capital component and reusable handle that is easily draped. In a healthcare environment where costs matter, all device-related accessories are in each catheter set at no additional charge, including the Rotorex guidewire. This device is not for use in cardiopulmonary, coronary, cerebral, iliac, renal, or venous vasculature. To learn more, visit bd.com slash rotorex. Click the link in the podcast notes for instructions for use for indications, contraindications, hazards, warnings, and precautions. Now, back to the episode. Today, we're going to discuss the dialysis circuit with Dr. Ari Kramer, a recurring guest. I looked back and we last had Ari on the show, episode 139, March of 2020. So it looks like we released that right in the heart of COVID. So today, things look a little bit different and we're going to talk about his practice. And specifically, we're going to be talking about treating stenoses in the dialysis circuit with either DCBs, drug-coated balloons, or stent grafts. Ari, welcome back to the show. Hey, man, thanks for that great introduction. Great to be back. Man, very appreciate you coming on the show. For those interested, go back and listen to episode 139. Ari killed it then. He's going to kill it today. But Ari, can you just uh, tell us a little bit about your background and your training, and then we'll get into like what your practice looks like? Absolutely. So I am a general surgeon by training. I graduated in 2002. And from 2005 until present, I have tailored my practice to exclusively treat dialysis access patients. I operate in a hospital-based setting uh, Monday through Friday with uh, block time uh, protected for the treatment of said patients. And we intervene on roughly 1,500 patients per year uh, or encounters per year in that single OR setting. So as far as like not dialysis creation, but maintenance, declots, fistulograms, how many are you doing just roughly a week ballpark? Uh, we do roughly 35 to 50 patients a week. All right. So you know what you're talking about. Is that fair to say? <laughs> I've made <laughs> enough mistakes that uh, you can trust me that if it's not working, I've definitely screwed it up. How about that? Okay. All right. That's fair. Yeah. So let's just start, uh, start with like uh, your procedure, like the fish telegram. I just want to know um, basic procedure. How do, you, how do you perform it? Like, you know, where do you start? What do you do? Ultrasound, fluoro, combo, whatever. Yeah. Uh, so I think, first of all, the setting in which we receive patients is important. I, um, I'm the sole operator in my practice. So I have two nurse practitioners that help assist in the office setting as well as receive consults in the hospital setting. And so we have about a 30% add-on rate, and those cases include new acute injuries of, of patients with uh, failure that are needing new tunnel central venous catheters or subsequent mappings, et cetera, for new access creation. 
and they come again from both the inpatient and outpatient setting. Uh, when a patient is identified to have uh, AV access circuit uh, malfunction, those patients are first screened in our office when available for ultrasound. And a duplex ultrasonography is performed by our vascular uh, tech, our ultrasound tech, RVT. And uh, based on those findings, if the ultrasound elicits uh, stenosis, etc., cetera, uh, we would then triage the patient to the operative setting. Uh, if we can do so in the same day, we prefer that. But there are instances, of course, where transportation is limited and we can't ar arrange that. Otherwise, those patients, if, uh, if amenable, are scheduled for elective procedures, and that would be an angiogram, as you suggested. And typically, that's within the week to two weeks after seeing the patient in the office. And similarly, for new access creations of, of all types, when a patient arrives to us, we um, reevaluate them and re-ascertain their history and physical findings at the bedside. And uh, with physical exam, we can pretty much indicate whether or not the ultrasound is a reasonable you know, assessment, is given an, a reasonable assessment of the, of the access dysfunction, uh, and marry that with the patient's complaint and the dialysis complaint. And 99% not 99, but the greatest majority of the times, 80% up, there's concordance between what the ultrasound sees, what my physical exam shows, and what the patient reports and the dialysis center reports, and we would move on with an intervention. At that time, patient is brought to the operating room. We will repeat an ultrasound on table uh, just to, again, determine uh, vessel sizing type uh, of stenosis, site of stenosis if it's visible, uh, so we can kind of do our pre-planning and um, catheter introduction in in a place that will uh, serve the best need. So, so on, can, can I back you up and just hear a little bit sure. about like that on the table ultrasound? So mm -hmm. like, what does that look like? Like the whole arm and the chest is exposed and you take it all the way from inflow, anastomosis, like as far up as you can see. That's it. You, you hit okay. it right. So patient comes in on a stretcher. They move them over uh, from the stretcher to the main OR table, fluoro bed, arm extended on an arm board, uh, which is fluoro compatible. And we do a manual palpation of the access. I like to use the L18 probe and uh, use that, you know, 18 megahertz probe up and down mm -hmm. the arm from uh, the anastomosis uh, through the outflow. And if the outflow looks fine, certainly we go and uh, reevaluate the brachial artery inflow and then the uh, forearm vasculature, it, depending on where that access is. Okay. Let, and let's, for the sake of ease, like, let's just assume like it's an outflow issue because I assume that like, you know, if you have inflow symptoms, then your access is a little bit different. But is it fair to say that the majority of patients that are getting referred, it's, it's an outflow issue? For the greater majority. And yeah. of course, there's, um, you know, there's a, a difference too in autogenous and non-autogenous circuits. So, sure. you know, that also is a little bit of a nuance in how we approach each of these patients. Because I do a very high rate now of percutaneous fistulas, we've gotten very facile with uh, radial artery cannulation and have used radial artery can cannulation far more aggressively than at any point in my career. And that has really opened up a whole array of treatment options for radiocephalic fistula, uh, immature fistulas, et cetera. So we, we use that with some reliance now, and, and um, I should just add that as a caveat. Okay, fair enough. And I know I'm ignoring a lot of the nuance, but I was just trying to like bring it in to focus about, you know, what does like your standard fistulagram look like? So you've done the ultrasound, you have the patient on the table from just like how you get access to how do you take the pictures and, and what are you looking for during those, uh, you know, during after the imaging uh, is up? So in a non-radial access case, I typically am approximately one, two finger breaths above the arterial anastomosis on the access if we're dealing with a venous outflow issue, trying to capture the greatest visualization of the outflow uh, venous circuit. But hold on. So for, for some of the, the uninitiated, why don't you just access as close to the anastomosis as possible? Well, uh, you number one, um, there's, there's a couple of things. A lot of times there are subclinical stenoses that you can identify in that outflow circuit that you may treat or not treat based on the overall uh, picture. The second thing is uh, if, if you do miss an inflow issue for any reason, you're going to have to add a second catheter to come back um, the other way 
to go in a retrograde approach. And then lastly, depending on how close you are, your sheath may actually cross into uh, the venous outflow issue itself. And then you can't deliver adequate therapy from where that sheath would be positioned. So for all of those various reasons, it's easier to stay as far away um, within working wire distance and an instrument shaft length uh, as you can so that you can address the area all the way from the cannulation point to the central venous system and address all of the potential issues on the outflow if possible. So also like with the question that I was trying to ask, and I think you may have answered it, but I was like asking like, why don't you access the um, fistula like as close as, as close to the anastomosis as possible? Oh, you're talking about at the arterial inflow? Yeah, the, like the, the arterial inflow. Like, so if you want to capture, you know, you're trying to capture like as much like venous outflow as you want. Why don't you just like, you know, you said two finger breaths away from the anastomosis. Why don't you just like drill it down right on top of like the juxtaarterial segment? That's what I was trying to get at. Well, so there's a couple of things that can happen here. Number one, if you're talking about a, a fistula, um, depending on the takeoff of that fistula, you can actually occlude the out, that segment of vein. It can get pretty tight in that area. Um, and it may not be clinically relevant, but by introducing the catheter, you can reduce flow and obstruct flow such that you actually damage that area and can actually clot the circuit. So that is a, <clears throat> a pretty good reason right there. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you were hunting for something separate. Plus, you know, when you take your sheath out, you do get a little peri-anastomotic um, uh, hematoma that can be compressing. And when you, uh, depending on the patient's blood pressure and our, you know, average here somewhere between 180, 190 uh, millimeters of mercury on the systolic pressure, a lot of times the bleeding is a little bit more difficult to control uh, just at that site because it's so arterialized and, and less compressible. So those are sort of reasons right off the bat. No, you, you landed it. That's, that's exactly what I was thinking. Um, sometimes like, I remember especially early on in my training, I'd access too close to that juxtaarterial segment. And especially with D-clots, like then your venous sheath like kind of ends up being, it's not like, a, sometimes it's occlusive, but sometimes it's just like slowing the flow and then you're like, ah, oh, such a pain. And so, you know, it's like yeah. lesson learned uh, having done enough of these. All right, but continue. So you're, you're accessing, you're trying to get as much venous outflow as possible. Yeah. And um, I like to use, when I start these exams, I like to actually start at the central venous system and work back to my working sheath. And that's generally what I would do. And um, we try to dilute our contrast one to two, one to three, and do little mini boluses. Sometimes we use a little bit of stronger contrast to visualize the central venous system. And we usually would subtract the central venous system to get uh, the best, clearest view, ask the patient, you know, hold their breath, et cetera, reduce mm -hmm. motion. Uh, and from there, we call them, you know, walk the dog. Like we kind of just walk back you know, all the way back to your inflow closest to the sheath. And if there is a lesion in transit on the, on the way from that central system, walk back to the arterial inflow. Um, oftentimes, if it's a, an angioplasty is indicated, we'll use that opportunity with full of, you know, with the balloon being up to do a reflux evaluation and kind of kill a little bit of time to see the inflow and kind of plan for that next procedure which might or may not, your intervention that may or may not be necessary to help complete the, uh, the angiogram at that time. So why do you go central and then work your way back to the access? Well, my general feeling is I prefer to start uh, with regard to flow, I say distally, okay? So closest to, sure, the, sure, sure. to the central system as possible because uh, a couple of things. The first thing is when we, the bet to consider that the first treatment that we render most most realistically for access maintenance and salvage is an angioplasty. And those are typically high balloon pressures that we're, we're using. Typically, you know, this will be 70% or greater. I think if you look at most series, you'll find that that's true. And when we do those balloons in a uh, fibrotic lesion, you can, uh, well, you do rupture them to start. But at the, at the same token, you can have uh, occult injuries that you don't realize uh, just because the outflow has a very low pressure. But if you reverse that and you were to treat a lesion closest to the arterial uh, inflow, you let's say it's in the cannulation zone, and you treat that lesion with a high-pressure balloon, then move to the outflow and treat a second 
a lesion, what you do is place an undue amount of pressure on that cannulation zone because you've moved further away. And so now you have all of that arterial pressure at this weakened segment that you've just delivered a therapy to. Um, and depending on how aggressive you were at that treatment, um, you can lead to contrast blush and hematomas, et cetera, which were, would have been unnecessary. Okay. Fair enough. So once you see a stenosis, will you kind of walk us through like your thought process into trying to determine whether or not it's a significant stenosis? Like you, you mentioned 70%, a lot of the series talk about 70%, but you eyeballing it, do you actually do some measurements, bring out some calipers on the computer or, you know, like, but, but talk about your thought processes, like what's, what constitutes a significant stenosis? There are a couple of different things that constitute a significant stenosis. And the first is if you want to use absolute criteria, it has to be, you know, greater than 50% um, of flow limiting stenosis, which if you see that in cross-sectional area, that would be 75% flow limiting. That would be kind of, you know, your rule of thumb. Now, most of the time we can ascertain that with ultrasound ahead of time. Sure. And you have a uh, reference vessel diameter, and this is kind of where it can get a little bit confusing, right? So where is that stenosis and what is that stenosis relative to? And that's kind of where it gets murky and sometimes it's hard to discern from the literature what is clinically significant versus not. But I like to use the cannulation, I like to use the reference artery that feeds that access as my reference to whether or not I have uh, a, a significant stenosis. I've heard, you know, this batted around lots of places, and I like actually John Swinnon kind of gave me a little bit of instruction on this, and he's a, he's a great guy, by the way. And he uses 0.2, uh, so, so two millimeters or less is an absolute criteria to intervene uh, rather than as a, as a percent stenosis. He, he uses actual measurements for that diameter or the, the tightness of that stenosis to indicate whether or not you have an absolute criteria or not. If you have 0.2, regardless of symptoms, he says you should intervene. And I tend to agree with that. If you are greater than 0.2, well, then you are, you are defaulting a little bit more on the clinical revel uh, relevance of that lesion. Uh, is the patient not meeting transonics or low? Uh, is it bleeding, you know, slow venous ooze post cannulation, mm -hmm. you know, what's the problem, right? You can sure. kind of fit that into your, your algorithm. But again, the main thing is if the patient has been referred to you, it's always, um, there, there are absolute criteria for billing purposes, but then there are clinical criteria that the patient has to get adequate dialysis and they have to do it in a safe setting. So you're really measuring those two all mm -hmm. of the time and taking the most composite information you can to give a holistic result such that the patient's need is actually satisfied. You feel like you've done a true justice to the patient and they can actually receive the therapy that they need. So mm -hmm. I would still default on between somewhere between those two. It's an absolute stenosis of 50% or less than 0.2 millimeters. Hold on, 0.2 millimeters? Pardon, pardon, two millimeters. Yes, yeah, yeah, two, yeah, two, yeah. Two, 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 two millimeters. millimeters. Yes, yeah. yes, sir. Well, I was for the audience only, um, or most everyone's audience. Oh, no, we have some YouTube listeners, but I was kind of nodding my head as Ari was talking about, like, you have to marry, like, for these dialysis circuits, you have to marry, like, the clinical problem, like, with what you're seeing on the angio. So you have to know ahead of time, like, what was the issue with the dialysis circuit that got, that prompted the visit? So I, I think that's well done. But one of the things I wanted to touch upon, do you have anything specific to say about collaterals? Like whenever you whenever you do a run and you're like, ah, I'm not sure if that's like much of a stenosis, but you're seeing a lot of collaterals. Like, does that trigger you to do anything different or like take a harder look at that area? Always. You know, those. So mm -hmm. particularly with fistulas, I think you have to know where you are in the life of that access circuit to begin with. Um, and to see if you had any previous angiographic imaging prior to, to the study you're doing uh, to assess that. And um, it's, it's a bit of everything, right? So the patient mm -hmm. may be volume overloaded. Typically, if they're coming to see you, they may have missed the dialysis day. So they're, you know, they're going to be a little bit different uh, depending on whether they got a partial treatment, no treatment, how many days away from treatment, et cetera, and, and the tightness of the stenosis uh, and their current blood pressure. So... Yes. The, the short answer is yes. Anytime we see collateral flow, you have to assume that the central pressure beyond the lesion is meaningful because it's pushing back and you see mm -hmm. these collaterals. 
um, early in my you know career, I would used to chase those, you know, uh, not really understanding the nuance of that. And honestly, what you end up with is, uh, you know, remodeling the fistula in an unfavorable way. You, you push more flow uh, through the outflow circuit, which tends to increase shear forces and uh, cause, you know, mostly a lot of outflow stenosis, aneurysm will change, et cetera. And I think a lot of that we really, um, really came to understand well, again, with percutaneous fistula. When you say chase the collaterals, I just wanted to make sure that I knew what you're talking about. Are you talking about like chasing them for ligation or embolization or yes, like sir. chase? Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Because sometimes I, I do in a way chase collaterals and that like if I see collaterals that I don't think belong there either in the neck or the arm, I'm like, there's a stenosis here. We just have to go find it. Absolutely. And, and okay. many times you can, and many times those collaterals, if you feel uh, very comfortable with it, uh, with your, with your assessment, as you said. You know, you, you feel like, oh, I think I have the right balloon, but you may be undersized that mm -hmm. balloon. And so you have to, you know, go up a size. And so, you know, very frequently, you know, I would say that my most common used balloon in the AV axis circuit's probably an eight uh, balloon. Um, and I like long balloons. I typically use eight tens. Oh, really? Mm hmm. I really do. I like, I like that long, high pressure balloon um, I find to give me the best results. In the access circuit, and again, there's a lot of subclinical uh, stuff that we that we do see come up when we do that. Well, you talk about like once you've decided to intervene your angioplasty, because for those there's some people who are not going to go back and listen to 139, but I thought like you had a good approach to like how you how you do angioplasty, just like POBA. Well, I will say that you know first, you know my awareness you know over these past couple of years has been heightened about how really poorly we have done POBA. And you know, kind of segues a little bit into our talk and to you know where where I think we're going to be headed. Pre two thousand ten, you know, um, and just prior to the advent of you know high pressure balloons, etc., there was a lot of you know a lot of requests or a lot of expectation that plain balloon angioplasty would you know get you fifty percent a result at six months. That was kind of the expectation. High pressure balloons came along, and surprisingly, with high pressure balloons, uh, the state vent data uh, really demonstrated that we were only getting 25, 30% um, at six months with plain balloon angioplasty. And then we move forward 10 years from then, and we get into the era of DCBs, and the two largest trials are the IMPACT trial and the Lutonix trial. And both of those returned to a very high uh, performance rate for plain balloon angioplasty, and then the data uh, are what they are for each of those trials on the outcomes of the drug-coated balloon. But I think the take-home message here is, is that with protracted balloon angioplasty, I think we got away from that a little bit, particularly in the, in the era of stenting. We weren't really doing a lot of uh, high-pressure balloon angioplasty protracted. And the what I mean by for protracted, it's yeah, somewhere what is, between... Yeah, what is protracted? Like, is it... It's one to three minutes in the literature, yeah. you know, it's kind of what it shows. And I don't know that, you know, that there are people who are who are routinely doing three-minute angioplasties with plain balloon angioplasty. Um, and I confess that I get a little itchy at, <laughs> at you know, 60 seconds to 90 seconds. <laughs> I'm not going to say no, but but for sure, since being made aware of that, that POBA data in the DCB trials, I have made a point of it. And so as a segue to that, I would say that vessel prep is essential. And we're really coming to a time of understanding uh, that tools like Plex uh, is an interesting device in conjunction with a plain balloon angioplasty can really enhance outcomes of that balloon angioplasty and then if we're going to add the special sauce of DCB, um, you're only going to get a greater rate of return in that arena. Hold on. I don't actually, I don't know what, I don't know what flex is. Like when you said vessel prep and flex, like I didn't know, I'm not familiar with the device. So flex is a, a treatment ele element actuator, right? It has a, uh, it has three flex contours, which are essentially wire-like projections that come out in um, equivalent angles away. So almost like in, in the position of a Mercedes emblem. Okay. And 
much like a, a stent or other where you deploy with a finger actuator, the uh, blades, when they are out into the vessel, they continue to exert a one atmosphere of pressure, continuous pressure. And so as you retract the device over wire, it leaves impressions into those uh, stenoses. Okay. And so that reduces... Uh, because you have continuous engagement in the stenosis, it reduces circumferential uh, fibromuscular tension. And so it loosen, it lowers the pressure to release some of these stenoses. So typically, and uh, Dr. Rooney just gave a nice talk about this at V. but so typically what we see are high burst pressures uh, of these lesions at dialysis most are greater than 20 atmospheres of pressure or hovering in there. When we use uh, the flex in advance of POBA, uh, that pressure will come down by a third in many instances uh, to even a half. And so the, the result of that is a more favorable angioplasty that is more durable, it's less traumatic, less painful to the patient, and we see the outcomes extending uh, far differently than we would have uh, with traditional POBA. So Flex is a very, very, very interesting device. And uh, like many of these devices that are coming to market, it recognizes uh, the necessity of doing an adequate balloon angioplasty. But the best way to do that sometimes is to prepare the vessel for the angioplasty to then do a protracted balloon angioplasty to then add another therapy like paclitaxel to your your treatment segment. So it's it's you know the game is really changing, and um, it's interesting at how many different people are in this space now. It's exciting because it, that it was not always the case. Wow, I had you on to come talk about DCBs, instant graphs, and then you just throw in flex. You just threw in flex. <laughs> had no idea. <laughs> All right. So so I do want to get one thing out of the way. So we, we've covered like protracted balloon angioplasty um, and the flex device. But I wanted to get like if we're going to talk about DCBs versus stent grafts, I'll just open it up to you. Why aren't we talking about bare metal stents? Like, is this part of the algorithm and your treatment algorithm at all, like for the dialysis circuit? No, um, I think Bare metal stents, we've we've proven without a shadow of a doubt, are no better than PTA and often worse than PTA. And so we can take bare metal out of the equation at this time. Uh, there's no level one evidence to support the use of bare metal in the AV access circuit. Okay. All right, good. So we get it out of the way. Public service announcement. Yeah. Public service announcement. Like Don't do it. All right. So DCBs versus stent graphs. Um, you know, for my outline, I just have... Let's start with DCB. Um, what is a DCB, and do you like them? Do you not like them? But also, you got to. So we have some. We have some younger audience. Like, what is the DCB? Um, and, and we'll get into like the technique and how you use it and stuff. Right. So, uh, drug coated balloon is a mm -hmm. DCB, sometimes known as a DEB, depending on what you know who who said it and what. So, drug coated balloon is a delivery device versus a drug eluding balloon. There are two that are on label use for the AV access circuit currently. One is Lutonix and the other is the Impact AV DCB. Of the two balloons that are on the market, only one device, and that's the Impact AV DCB, uh, was in a trial where it met its endpoint. And so if you're going to follow level one evidence to its conclusion, uh, then the Impact AV DCB would be the balloon of choice in HOPD setting in particular. These devices are not reimbursable outside for any reason, like there's no pass-through codes. Mm -hmm. So they are add-ons that are to provide a clinical benefit. And the only one that continues to show superiority is the Impact AV DCB. So the platform... Uh, of that is a, it's a drug eluding, it's a drug coated balloon. Okay. So it has standard uh, PTA balloon 
in all the various sizes from four to 12 millimeter diameters. You know, they come in 40 to 150 millimeter lengths. Um, there's a 40 to 80 or 130 centimeter shaft length, which uh, gets you to where you need to be. The drug is paclitaxel, which I think has a, is very widely recognized for its anti-restenotic properties, particularly interrupting the G1 cell cycle. The drug is hydrophobic, which means, you know, it doesn't, doesn't like water. So you got to get it where it, where it needs to go. It, it, it is lipophilic. So it's going to want to hold on to fat, uh, storage. Um, and the dosing in the impact balloon is 3.5 micrograms uh, per millimeter. So that is delivered. It's on a urea excipient, which is what helps you offload the paclitaxel, um, where it is then picked up by macrophages, brought into the media. And it does that in its crystalline form. And in that crystalline form, it it continues to act as a, a reservoir of that drug, which we believe, because of those unique uh, properties, is why you see better results with the impact AVDCB than Lutonix. Some of it's the dosing, some of it's the pharmacology, and then how you continue to have that pharmacology continue to perform because it's it's acting as a reservoir. I wanted to actually back you up on the Lutonix versus, um, I'm sorry, it's Lutonix and Impact mm -hmm. is the brand name. Are you dogmatic about like, you got to use the Impact or? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, we, we, absolutely. <laughs> what I just meant like, um, what if like, you, you know, for whatever reason, your cath lab doesn't have it. Like is having like, is having access to the DCB like if you only can get Lutonix, is that like, hey, you're meeting the need of your patients or, hey, man, you got to go out and get an impact. And by the way, I have no idea, audience, if we're actually being sponsored by impact or not. We should probably take them this podcast if we are. Uh, you're not being sponsored by them. But I mean, okay. if, right. So if you why wanna, aren't they sponsoring us? Sorry. It's a, it's a good question. Um, well, so here we go. I was a part of the Lutonix uh, post-market approval. Okay, I was okay. part of that trial. And um, the results that we saw were okay. They weren't resounding. And for the dollars spent, I personally didn't feel like we got a big push. I was incredibly resistant to continued use of drug-coated balloons based on the cost mm -hmm. that we were seeing in the chair days that the patient would appreciate before re returning for a dysfunctional fistula. It's fair to say now that um, when I saw the data, this data was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in September of 2020, right? I mean, it's, right. Front, it's right there in front of all of our colleagues. Lookstein, and, right? Mm, Lookstein. And mm -hmm. it's, it is very, very compelling and hard to look away from. And while the trial design is a bit different and subtly so, there's enough of my clinical experience and there's enough in the data that where those two, where the science and clinic come together and it's hand in glove. Mm -hmm. The Lutonix data, if we look at uh, their AVIDE trial, not only did it not reach clinical significance, but there was only 2.5 months between plain balloon angioplasty and Lutonix before next treatment for 50% of their treated population. In the IDE trial for the impact AV DCB, the window is 14.7 months between treatments. So it is a very substantially different uh, set of data. Now, again, you can't compare exact trial sure. to exact trial because they're different, but clinically, we have patients that go out 20 months and they are not needing repeat interventions. And so in the early six months, there's a 56% reduction in intervention. There's a marked decrease in, you know, your treatment, uh, target lesion, restenosis. There's marked improvement in 
access circuit patency that are far superior to what was reported in Lutonix. So um, when you ask me, am I dogmatic about it? Only in the sense that I, I believe the science and I have become, you know, to be fair, I am, I'm a consultant for Medtronic on that point. And it's only fair for me to announce that because I didn't believe it and was resistant to it. But I feel very compelled to use the balloon in autogenous fistula because that's what the data show. All right. I like it. So can we talk about a little bit about the technique uh, in terms of you have a lesion. Maybe we need to back up a little bit further. You've already alluded to it. AV fistulas. Which patients are you using it on? And then how do you use it? Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. So I use it in the way that the trial was designed. And I think Smart that, move. yeah, <laughs> you know, and I think, I think that's kind of where, where we should be going. Right. And I think that's the benefit of a, of a talk like this is to kind of, what is the science and, and where do you apply these things? Right. So if you're going to say that we want to move to level one evidence and you're going to use peer reviewed science to help shape your decisions, well, then for the uh, impact AV DCB trial, this is all fistulas of all types, upper arm uh, of radiocephalic on up to brachiocephalics, you know, uh, brachiobacillics, et cetera. There was a higher preponderance in that trial of radiocephalic fistula because there was an inclusion of Japan and New Zealand, but 50% um, were upper arm brachiocephalics and BVT, so representative of the North American experience as well. The treatment zone includes the arterial anastomosis all the way out through the swing segment, cannulation zone, venous valve flow, cephalic arch, and excludes anything that is the central venous system or the areas that I just described. It was not to include graft. This is only autogenous fistula. It excludes covered stenting, which wasn't the case for Lutonix, which is why I said they're not exactly uh, identical trials. I also wanted to, to back up like uh, when you said like not indicated for the central venous segment. So like what is considered central venous? Like where's the demarcation? Axillosubclavian subclavian junction. Got it. Got it. But we also have to talk about, so you talked about the patients that you use it in, the locations that you use it in, but we also talk about just the nuts and bolts of like how you how? use the drug-coated balloon. Yeah. I mean, not just like that because, but there's like vessel prep that goes along to it. You know, you don't just yep. throw in the DCB. Yeah. No, no. So, so again, you know, we, we go back how both of these trials were constructed and it, it starts with high pressure balloon angioplasty and protracted balloon angioplasty. Neither trial declared in their trial experience that the that they would prescribe the time, but generally speaking across both trials, that was a 90-second balloon hold at full inflation, full effacement of the balloon. In my experience, I try to mirror that. So I will put the balloon up where I get full effacement. I look, um, and I'll, I'm not going to sit here and say it's 90 seconds on everyone. I'm not. What I'm going to say is that I look at how many atmospheres the balloon is up where it opens. And then so long as that balloon doesn't start ticking down, if I get 15 mm -hmm. seconds, 20 seconds at the balloons, not coming down, I consider that, um, you know, protracted balloon angioplasty because it's at a steady state. Uh, then I will take that balloon down. Let's say I opened with an eight. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we, we were using an eight balloon. Now the drug coated balloon also over the 035 wire, we go and we get one centimeter crossing where the lesion is covered by one centimeter at least, no different than a stent, really. Sure. Approximately and distally. And that balloon goes up for 180 seconds and uh, typically 10 atmospheres of pressure. And so uh, while the drug offloads, that's the, that's the necessity, right? So there's no treatment being rendered with the, the next balloon or the drug-coated balloon other than to deliver the therapy. So this is a drug delivery device. Uh, the balloons are not intended in any way, shape, or form to be treatment devices when we consider treatment of the stenosis. Gotcha. Any run in between the plain old balloon versus the DCB or? Uh, oh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Right. Okay. So you want, you want to make sure, you know, standard, once we go mm -hmm. ahead and we, we inflate the balloon, uh, the first balloon, we want to always follow up, make sure we don't have an, uh, an injury, et cetera. Sure. Dissection, you name mm -hmm. it. We want to make sure that that anatomy is clean. Okay. 
Can you describe a couple of situations where you're like, all right, high grade stenosis, intervene with an eight. And what are some of the times when you're like, oh, well, this isn't a good fit for a drug coated balloon, like when, when the anatomy isn't clean? Can you talk about those situations? Well, if we have um, if we have a rupture, you know, blush, anything like this, uh, typically, I, I, you know, I won't do it. Now, there are some there have been instances where they've been contained. Now, this is my practice. This is not, mm-hmm. you know, uh, on label discussion. I'm talking about what I do. And, yeah. um, no, this is the this is the good stuff, right? <laughs> right. You know, so so yeah. So if there's an outflow lesion and we get a small blush, I put my my plain balloon angioplasty back up, and you know we'll wait the you know the requisite time, you know thirty seconds, sixty seconds, whatever you feel comfortable with. Drop the balloon with it still in place without moving it, continuing to maintain wire control, balloon control. We'll shoot and see if we have continued expansion of that uh, contrast or not. If mm-hmm. there's no further contrast expansion, I'll retrieve the balloon and probably shoot again, right? Just to make sure that, hey, all right, I didn't move the balloon. Uh, everything's stable. There's no contrast extrav uh, that's continuing. You know, I probably would go ahead at that point, depending on where we are, use a, a drug-coated balloon. Um, and again, th- using the same formula as we described. Now, if um, in this instance, you know, we're in this fistula, let's say it's the cephalic arch, you know, and I get, you know, this massive, you know, extravasation because I had a very tight lesion. I oversized the balloon, made an error in judgment, or the vessel was more frail than I mm-hmm. had expected. Now, typically, I won't do that. Uh, I won't put the drug-coated balloon in because if it's a massive expanding hematoma, I'm getting pulsatility. Uh, well, guess what? I still use coverage stents. And so for salvage in an autogenous circuit, if I can't uh, continue on with my prescribed plan and therapy... I think there's, you know, fair evidence that, you know, that a covered stent in that particular position is is pretty good. It's not as good as as an autogenous circuit, but certainly I think covered stents have a place also. Uh, but I typically reserve the these for bailout situations rather mm-hmm. than as primary treatments in an autogenous circuit. Okay, and when you say the autologous uh, the autologous circuit, that's AV fistulas. AV fistulas. We're not talking about grafts, right? Right. So are there any increased complications in adding the drug-coated balloon or the drug-eluting balloon to the algorithm? No. Um, in fact, there was concern. What about increased mortality with Paxlitec? <laughs> right. Well, you know, the FDA went on a, a, a rightful concern that, mm-hmm. that Paxlitaxel, uh, there was a signal that, that they saw that paclitaxel would be associated with increased mortality. Well, now out to 36 months on the impact uh, trial, and that data continues to accrue, that signal has been dismissed as as a false signal. And in fact, the mortality data support a more favorable outcome for patients who receive the DCB and the dialysis access circuit than plain balloon angioplasty. So it was a false signal. But it was something certainly that was out there and limited the use and utility of these balloons for a bit uh, just while that was sorted out. Sure. Any other complications for people to keep on their radar at all? No, I'm mean, not unless you can you know, speak to drug allergies um, or particular sure. reasons. But no, no cardiac toxicities, you know, no mm-hmm. other events uh, that I've seen, no infections, um, mm-hmm. nothing. It's, you know, the, the, the safety endpoint was met. And there's no increased uh, SAE um, or serious adverse event mm-hmm. um, at 90 days with any, any with either tr- therapy. They're indistinguishable. Okay. Can we talk about the cost? I mean, you've kind of already alluded to drug eluding balloons for a cost factor. Um, that's that's kind of an issue. Like, what do you what do you do about it, or how do you address it? That's a tough one, right? I again, I I preface this that I'm practicing in an HOPD setting. And Hold on, you know, the, for those who don't know what's HOPD. Hosp- hospital-based dialysis yeah. centers. Okay, so I'm in the main OR, and uh, our facility reimbursement is such that uh, we can absorb that cost. We don't get any extra payment for it. It's just mm-hmm. that the total bundle of payment that we do for an angiogram with uh, PTA, the, the cost of the device is in there. Uh, it's not fun to tell my administrators that we used it, but the fact is we can do it in the 
uh, idea that we are realizing a lower incidence of complications and repeat interventions that may drive hospitalizations from failures of those mm -hmm. AV access circuits. Uh, and so that for us is valuable enough that it allows its continued use. Now in other settings, ambulatory settings and OBLs, that becomes extremely tricky. The mm -hmm. data are, are compelling and it doesn't matter where you are, the data are compelling. But if the bundle payment to the facility is such that you're underwater to give the therapy, you're not going to be able to treat anybody. Uh, and so in that particular situation, I think that it's, it's imperative upon us as practitioners to reach out to our congresses, et cetera, to say that, hey, there should be a cost pass through or reimbursement to mitigate that, that downside risk to a clinician who's trying to provide the highest standard of care following level one evidence uh, and provide that no matter the site of service to their patient. But that's something that is for all of us to engage in because you would hope that in the truest sense that CMS would allow us to deliver those therapies to the most fragile group of patients that we see that are ambulatory and they should have the ability to get that therapy no matter where they go. So what would you say to the practitioner who is like, look, I, I get the data, I've seen the data and it, it's kind of compelling, but Kedoku guidelines, there's no, at, at this point from like the 2019 guidelines, uh, unless I'm not aware of an update, you know, it doesn't really say that you have to use drug eluting balloons or drug coated balloons. I think that's fair. Um, yeah. you know, it's, it's a fair statement, but I think K Doki's guidelines also in 2019 said that the DCB trials were underway and yeah, yeah, that, yeah. and then barring, you know, some revelatory uh, information, which we had, we don't make that recommendation, but stay tuned. So I think, I think that, uh, unequivocally those recommendations will change based on the science. And, um, I think the. The real pressure, again, is going to be back to these Congresses and to CMS to kind of justify or rectify what is not a, a, an adequate situation where you have therapy that has been proven to work and we're not able to render that therapy to patients who are most at risk. When, I have no idea, when do these guidelines get updated? Is it like on a periodic basis or like is it every... They do it, you know, they do a revisitation every year. I know K-Doki, they, they look at their numbers uh, pretty routinely. The last one mm -hmm. was 2019. COVID interrupted a little bit of it. And so I don't know specifically when they're going to, you know, revisit K-Doki's uh, update again for vascular access dysfunction. Okay. All right. So we've talked about drug-coated balloons or drug-eluting balloons, but that was kind of in comparison to balloon angioplasty. Can we talk about stent grafts, covered stents, and how that falls into your algorithm? You, you kind of already mentioned you, you're using it for bailout procedures, but can you talk, like, let's just start with the basics, like, what's a stent graft? And I'll let you go from there. Yeah. So stent grafts are uh, expanded PTFE uh, grafts with nitinol skeleton embedded in, in between. And there are a number of different products that have made it to market. Uh, I think probably the most prevalent of those are, you know, you know, BD's products, which would have been Fluency for a bit. There was the Flare for a bit. Now they've got Covera for a bit. And, you know, you've got Gore with their Viabon. And, and in my experience, those are, those are the most prevalent devices that are used in the AV access circuits. I think without any question, um, you know, the earliest level one data within the AV access circuit and treatment plans were regarding and, and evolved around Ziv Haskell's, you know, Sentinel paper in 2010, which also made the front of uh, the New England Journal of Medicine, incidentally. So I think the New England Journal has something to say when it comes to what's important uh, and to recognize. And so uh, that trial... Uh, showed for the first time the flare endovascular device uh, had in an increased target lesion patency and access circuit patency uh, beyond plain old balloon angioplasty. Uh, and it was such that it was motivating enough that they could continue that work and 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 it has led to many of the iterations and and the allowances for us to continue to use stents. Now all of that work was, surrounding AV graft use. 
Okay. So we're talking about AV graphs. Yes. So those non-autogenous. So I really think, you know, when we have this talk, the cleanest way to think about these things is that autogenous circuits and non-autogenous circuits have two different pathways of use. The autogenous pathway, I think right now in today's world, if you're going to treat outflow stenosis, you're only really talking about paclitaxel coated balloon. And I think you're only talking about the impact AVDCB in that setting for restenosis, in particular at target lesions anywhere in that circuit, because mm -hmm. that's what the data show. In AV grafts, I think that the data are equally compelling that covered stent is superior to plain balloon angioplasty at outflow venous stenotic lesions, particularly um, if you can extend the life of that, of that access circuit for two years. Then it becomes not only clinically valuable, but the economics of it are mm -hmm. also uh, making sense. There are a couple of trials in there that have, that have shown some real good, interesting information. There are, there are the two flare trials essentially that came out that showed superiority to plain balloon angioplasty. Uh, those were BD papers. Uh, then there was the revise trial that came out. That was the Viabon across the elbow uh, and in thrombos circuits. And now we have the Avenue uh, trial, uh, which is Covera. And we also have uh, the, pardon me, the uh, Aviva trial and the Avenue trial, uh, which is also uh, the Covera trial. But now the Avenue trial is making the switch over and saying, hey, how about AV access circuits? How about autogenous AV fistula? Mm -hmm. And now we're getting into the realm of DCB versus, you know, covered stent, sure. which is different right. than... We had two different arms. We had non-autogenous circuits, stents, clearly superior non-autogenous mm -hmm. circuits. Then we had autogenous circuits, DCB, clearly superior in autogenous circuits. Now we have this, here we go. Yeah, I'm ready yeah, to put, yeah, it, yeah. put it in the octagon. Let's go. All right, but let's, but let's um, like ex exclude autogenous circuits and then just talk about patients with uh, non-autogenous circuits. Where... In your practice, do you use stent grafts? Um, like you said, like anywhere along the outflow, but um, I was interested, like, does that actually play out? Like, are you actually stenting? Like, are you laying down more covered stents, like in this population? I just read a, a review here, you know, actually in preparation for this, and I like what was said here. I think that you have to know your population. I'm in a mm -hmm. unique setting, okay? So I am I'm a single surgeon who does his own access intervention. So I create and I maintain, salvage, and then make the decision for abandonment and then restart the circuit. Again, that's me. I know what my work looks like. I know what the anatomy looks like, and it's mm -hmm. continuous. When we're looking at multi-centered randomized trials, you have multiple operators and you don't know specifically what you're going to get. I don't typically use PTFE for my graft. I use bovine, where I like okay. to use, I use artograft and I find that it works better for me in my hands. I have a lower rate of infection and the rate of intervention is otherwise the same. I like the way it sews better. So that's what I have used for years here. When you say, or when I use stents, the answer is yes, but I typically, unless I can see an anatomic problem with my anastomosis, I typically try to start with plain balloon angioplasty first. Oftentimes, I find that if I'm required, if I need a stent in time zero, uh, so or, you know, I'd create my graft, it comes in and it's failing, and then I revisit that access. If I see an anatomic reason or, or remember the case for having had a poor anastomosis for some reason or one that I didn't feel 100% sure about, Sure, I'll use a covered stent right out. Mm -hmm. But short of that, um, because I know the consistency of, of what I'm doing and what my thought processes are from my initial creation till the time of that intervention, I'm a little bit resistant or more nuanced in my approach to putting a stent in. Regardless of that decision, 
the key is to not eat up too much distal territory. So mm -hmm. uh, many of the caveats are, you know, you upsize your stent by one. If you had a six graft, you would use a seven stent. And you don't want to extend more than a centimeter uh, past your uh, target lesion so that you can maintain as much length as possible for that uh, outflow. The caveats here are you don't want to jail outflow uh, segments that could be used or, or you, you don't want to have misplacement of these stents. So I'm sparing, reminded that you only have one time to place this device in the patient. So uh, taking all the due precaution and uh, rationale that would allow you to place a stent, certainly patient can't be infected, right? You can't sure. place them in a patient with sepsis, right? right? You know, bad idea. So, and again, you want to make sure that the length of those outflow lesions, you don't get too, too far where you can't get them back if, um, you know, if you have a mishap. So mm -hmm. things like that. I think that's a, a fair point. Some people who are advocates of stent grafts, uh, and reasonably so, there's, there's some good data behind it. And the, also the guidelines would suggest like self-expanding stent grafts over angioplasty for like in the AV grafts at the anastomosis. So we're talking about the venous anastomosis. But there are a lot of caveats to that. And, you know, if you're not either if you're not comfortable placing stent grafts or you don't know if you can land it or you're worried that you're going to jail off potential future access for, you know, someone like you, Ari, who, who's, you know, has the ability to go back and revise or create a new circuit. I think there's just a lot of caveats to be aware of. But that being said, it doesn't sound like you're like if the situation is right and it presents itself, then you'll go ahead and lay down a stent graft if, if it's appropriate. hundred um, yeah. percent. You know, the, these these are tools that I don't think that, you, you know, we need to be dogmatic about what we do. I think we need to let the evidence declare what mm -hmm. is best and then um, apply those technologies as best we're able in our own hands and try to mirror, you know, the experience that the science has shown us. It doesn't mean that everything is going to line up perfectly, um, but certainly the science should be our guide. The data should be our guide. But really, you know, how, do you, how what works best in your practice is going to be very much guided by your particular skill set, your awareness of the anatomy and physiology for that particular patient at that particular time, and your experience and comfort level with each of these therapies. Absolutely. So as far as talking about like stent grafts, can you speak a little bit about, and this maybe goes to like maybe some of our younger colleagues, but whether you're going to use a self-expanding stent or a balloon expandable stent, maybe the difference between those and like their roles in the dialysis circuit? Yeah. I use self-expanding stents. Um, I think whatever stent you're going to use in the AV access circuit, you have to make sure that it's conformable and, and mm -hmm. it's kink resistant. Uh, many of the balloon expandables, unfortunately, are not exactly kink resistant. So you, you put them up um, and then once the patient bends their elbow, for example, well, then it's got sure. a permanent kink. Uh, you have to remember that these devices have fatigue and that you want to use a device that has a proven history of success. Uh, so I think those are the big, big, big caveats. It's, it's a self-expanding stent for me and, and in my practice, you know, I'm, I'm Viabon or Covara, uh, and we, we tend to house, uh, a lot of Viabon stenting here, but Covara is, is, is very impressive. I mean, very impressive stuff. And we may, you know, have to look at that data a little bit more carefully as we move forward as well. And we look forward to those publications because we try as best we can, as I said, to mirror the data uh, and, and do as much as we can to let the science show us what path we should be on and then let our clinical outcomes dictate whether or not we're realizing the same outcomes that we see from the podium. Sure. All right. Big takeaways as far as like today. Like for me, one of the things I think that is like critically important to think about is I, th I thought the flex device was cool, but like for your plain old balloon angioplasty, prolong or protracted insufflations, that seems like key to like improving your success, some low hanging fruit. And it very much seems like drug coated balloons are kind of going to be in the algorithm moving forward. I mean, it's just a matter of time before Kidoki revises and that's going to be set in, right? I think there's no question. I think those are definitely the high points. I think adequate, you know, excellent vessel prep makes a big difference. Um, and if you're a center that can't afford drug-coated balloons, I think, you know, 
and you're, you're sparing on your stent use, regardless of anything, I think we have to revisit how we do balloon angioplasties. And I think in all the thought leaders and key opinion leaders, whatever you want to call them, you know, that I've been around, everyone comes away from these trials and says, you know what, we did a real bad job of uh, balloon <laughs> angioplasty. <laughs> and, and now we know it, you know, so, so the big dogs up there, you know, and there are many smart, smart, smart people uh, that I try to stick around. Uh, they all seem to, you know, believe strongly in that, even when there's disagreement everywhere else. Sure. All right. Um, how about this? Any uh, resources, papers, or guidelines? I mean, we m- mentioned a couple that I'm going to include in the so- show notes. Um, I'll do my. I did my best to like kind of keep some notes so we can throw them in there. But any other papers or guidelines that you'd like to mention that you found like is like very helpful if you're if you're kind of starting to dig in to like build your dialysis practice? Yeah. Uh, well, let me. Take a look over here and actually, and can tell I have you, a list of all the ones you wrote down too? I can send it to you. How about that? You're the man, all right. You're the man. I will send it to you, but um, maybe it's easier to do that. How about we include them in the show notes? But uh, I think all the yes. Sentinel papers that have the level one mm-hmm. evidence and that are uh, have been published or are waiting for conclusion, those are well worth it. I think you need to know both of those from the setting of an autogenous circuit, non-autogenous circuit, and then where we're moving forward in the hybrid uh, circuit. And so in the, in the hybrid environment, we're coming up to two that'll be coming up pretty quickly. And one is the Predator uh, study, and one is uh, Colvera's Avenue study. So keep your eyes out because these are, are going to be really impressive. But I think the Sentinel papers, the DCB papers, um, clearly there's the Lutonix and um, the Impact AVDCB uh, were, the, were the two biggest drug-coated balloon trials. There were many others, but those are the ones that gain the most attention and you should really understand those. Uh, your AV access for graphs, I think you need, you need to know the, the uh, Flare Pivotal trial, Renova. You need Revise, Rescue, Aviva, and Avenue. Those would be your papers, right. but I'll send them to you. Yeah, thanks. And uh, for people who are not on YouTube and don't have the benefit of uh, the visual for the um, the cameras, Ari's wearing a hat. It says fightdoctors.com. What is it? Uh, well, that's our combat company that works with uh, professional athletes. Uh, we work with nutrition, weight cuts, and general uh, preparedness for recovery so that combat athletes and people like you and I, who are, who are just NARPs, non-athletic regular people, we can enjoy, you know... <laughs> Uh, enjoy those Not same benefits. Regular people. <laughs> That's it, and uh, we also do CBD and stuff like that. So it's a uh, it's a fun little thing. It's a great, great company. It's really put us in touch with some amazing, amazing people uh, and taken me to places uh, that I never would have imagined. So it's it's a great, great little fun thing. That's awesome. Well, um, thanks for mentioning it here, Ari. All right, guys, thank you for joining us again for another good conversation with Dr. Ari Kramer. Ari, thank you so much for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. To our audience, if you enjoyed the show but want more, check out the show notes. They're going to be locked and stocked with a lot of papers that we mentioned for this show. And those can be found at www.backtable.com. And remember, the show notes are where you can also find that link to free CME. For others interested in supporting the show, like, subscribe, or share the podcast on social media, or go old school and just tell somebody about it. That does a long, uh, goes a long way to extend our reach. We really appreciate it. We'll see you next time on the Backtable Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Don, Michael Barraza, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team lead is Karen Gannon, with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, and Ness smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Article and transcript support by Taylor Robinson. And Delaney Aguilar. Social media and PR by Anne Dang. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening. Thanks again for listening.